Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to the Basic Assurances webinar series and to Factor 6, Safe Environments. Um, as Megan said, my name is Elizabeth Seitz, and I'm a Quality Enhancement Specialist with the Council on Quality and Leadership. CQL's vision and mission. Um, it's, you know, it's really important that we learn and understand what matters to each person, as each one of us define quality, quality differently. Our vision is a world of dignity, opportunity, and community for all people. And our mission is that we're dedicated to the definition, the measurement, and the improvement of personal quality of life. Change inspires CQL. That's why we're committed to partnering with providers and systems for organizational transformation. We really believe in the idea that quality is a continuous journey and CQL as an organization is proud to support other organizations on this journey. CQL believes in an appreciative inquiry approach to quality enhancement. In other words, we work with organizations to look at their strengths and then use those same concepts to strengthen other areas. And we look at everything as opportunities, not deficiencies. It's very easy to look at the negative or what's missing but that can often overwhelm and frustrate people. If we view things as opportunities, it makes it easier to work towards strengthening those areas. So just an overview of today's webinar. Um, uh, what we'll do first is we'll have an introduction to the basic assurances. Then we will discuss process and evidence collection before really diving into each of the four indicator areas that make up factor six. As you can see here, um, indicator A, B, C, and D will go into each one of those individually. Finally, we'll finish the hour with a brief discussion on some red flag areas, some data around factor six, and then we'll answer any questions that may come up. So let's start with an introduction to the basic assurances. These are fundamental non-negotiables that should be a part of each person's life. These are broken down into 10 different areas or factors, as you can see on the screen. Now, if you're new to accreditation with CQL, this is a really good place to start. A good suggestion is to use the basic assurances manual to read about and learn more on each of these basic assurances areas. So like I said, basic assurances focuses on essential, fundamental, and non-negotiable requirements for all service and support providers. We're looking beyond regulations and just meeting standards. Now, basic assurances are unique because they're looking at the perspective of each single person. Here's how the basic assurances are set up. So there are 10 factors. Okay? Uh, within each factor, there are indicators or subtopics. Okay? In factor six, there happens to be four indicator areas. Which in, within each of those indicators, of which there are 46 total within all the basic assurances, there are probes. So those are the questions that support the validation of that indicator. So they will help determine whether that indicator is in place in system and practice. And there are about a little over 340 probes throughout all the basic assurances. So as I just said before, there are two things that we're, we look at within each indicator, and that's system and practice. Okay. The system provides the structure for the practices. So this could be policies, procedures, training, or other types of systems. The practice is how the system is actually being implemented. So it's what is observed in daily operations. Any system or practice must be effective and must be robust. So if there is a policy in place that describes how something will be done, we're going to look at the policy and then we're going to look to see is the practice or how it's being done being done the way that the policy is stating that it should be. So let's learn a little bit about the process that CQL uses to gather evidence to learn about those systems and practices. With factor six, there are some primary methods of gathering information. 
There's document review, which, you know, could be all kinds of documents. We'll talk about those in a little bit, including policies. There's observations and visits, conversations with people, focus groups, uh, factor reviews, and personal outcome measures. Now with document review, um, the organization will want to analyze and explain how uh, policies and how systems are in place. So what we'll look at is policies and procedures. We'll look at assessments, staff training records, or other documents to get an accurate picture of how the organization promotes safe environments. Now, policies and procedures could detail safety systems, including organizational disaster plans and emergency response plans for each individual location. We'll look at meeting minutes from, say, incident review, safety, or quality assurance meetings. We'll look at reviews that have been done of internal and external inspections. And we'll also make sure that follow-up has been completed. We're gonna look at completed assessments. So with that, we're gonna look to see our risks and supports being identified for each person based on their individualized needs. Okay, blank or incomplete assessments do not provide us any information so we're always going to look for thoroughly completed assessments. Any form is only as good as as much as it is filled out. We'll look at staff training records to ensure that staff training and education on providing safety supports is occurring, that it's thorough, and that it is happening frequently enough to ensure understanding. We'll take a look at people's records. Um, you know, we'll look at how people are being educated and informed about safety, both at home, um, at work, um, and in the community. So in all facets of their life, not just in their home. We'll also look at people's support plans for any additional information that may be helpful if, in determining if a practice is in place. One of my favorite things is observations and visits. So visiting with people, visiting with staff, um, learning about um, what's happening in people's homes and seeing the environments that people frequent. So we like to spend time with people in as many settings as possible because we want to see our health and safety supports in place. Uh, we want to make sure that um, safety hazards um, are taken care of and that there are no hazards uh, within the environments that they frequent. We'll look for any adaptive equipment and home modifications that people need. And we'll also look for emergency equipment, um, fire extinguishers and other types of equipment that are essential uh, to maintaining safety. And any CQL accreditation will facilitate different types of focus groups. So we typically spend about an hour to an hour and a half with various groups of people where we'll ask a variety of open-ended questions to help us understand the application of systems within the organization. So some sample questions in the area of safety may be, what do you do in an emergency? Now, we'll typically be more specific than that because an emergency, that, that word is very vague. So we'll ask specifically about what do you do in a fire? What do you do if there's a tornado or an earthquake? Of course, this all depends on where you live. We might ask staff, what types of things are in place to help people stay safe. And then if we meet with family members, we may ask if they have any safety concerns for their loved ones. With factor reviews, um, each factor is reviewed with organizational members that have a role in the implementation of systems and practices pertaining to that factor. So in factor six, which again is safe environments, this may be a quality coordinator, a training coordinator, uh, facilities or maintenance staff, um, a chairperson or members of an incident review or safety committee. Essentially, we want to talk with anyone that can speak to the organization's systems and practices related to safety, to training, to licensing, etc. Okay? It's a great time to ask questions and to share best practices. We use personal outcome measures during this time to gather information as well because they, help, um, they allow us to better understand quality through the perspective of each person. 
Okay. So when we measure basic assurances, we typically complete personal outcome measures to gain an understanding of each person's perspective of the organization's practices. For example, um, in the area of safety, we always want to know what, if any, safety concerns a person has for themselves. I once interviewed a gentleman who had a safety concern about his staff texting while driving the agency vehicle. He felt safe in all other aspects of his life, but the fact that his staff were texting while driving the agency van and driving him and his housemates around really made him nervous um, and actually made him quite upset. So that was something that we learned, um, I learned in a, in a POM that I had done at one time. But it can have a big effect on people's feeling of, of being safe. Um, and it's not just the being, it's the feeling of safety. Okay, so let's dive in a little bit to each of the indicators in the area of safe environments. Now remember, there are four of them in factor six. So in indicator A, this is talking about how the organization provides individualized safety support. So there are a couple of probes here that are highlighted. Now, before we go to probe two, which is highlighted, the very first probe is about um, are people's abilities to be safe in their environments assessed? So one of the very fundamental things we're gonna look at is, are we assessing people's abilities and needs in the area of safety? So this could be any risks that come up. It could be dealing with chemicals or evacuation drills. It could be modifications needed. It could be what supports are needed in the kitchen to stay safe. But we want to make sure that um, we're identifying safety supports and needs for each person. Now probe two then um, goes into some basic areas. And this specifically talks about safety in the kitchen. So um, are we assessing, again, people's needs in the area of using um, different appliances, uh, the use of knives? Um, what supports do people need to learn to be safe? Uh, we also look at the ability to adjust hot water. Are people able to adjust hot water to a safe temperature or do they rely on staff to do this so they don't burn themselves? We also want to make sure that we're looking at evacuation, okay? So what supports do people need to evacuate in the event of fire or severe weather? Now, severe weather is very broad. It could mean anything. It just doesn't mean a thunderstorm. It could be a tornado. It could be um, an earthquake. It could be a, a hurricane. Again, this depends on what parts um, of the country and the world that you live in and what you are most likely to experience. We also want to assess or check in uh, to see what supports people need to call for help if needed, use 911, um, and also use cleaning supplies. Um, are people um, you know, able to understand, do they understand um, how toxic some cleaning supplies can be? Um, can we, instead of restrict people from using cleaning supplies, can we buy non-toxic cleaning supplies? And do people understand the appropriate use um, for each one of those um, different uh, cleaning supplies? Um, and then, of course, uh, beyond that, you know, there are other safety concerns specific to maybe that person, depending on their um, individual needs or the particular environment in which we're looking at. So. It could be in a group home. It could be in a person's own apartment or house. It could be in a day program or a work environment. Uh, we have to remember to, um, you know, think about the, the vehicle um, and within the community and within the neighborhood. So there are a lot of different areas to think about when uh, looking at what safety supports people need. In Pro 4, which is the second one that's highlighted, we're really looking to ensure that people aren't being supported more than they need to be. You know, when this is done, it's often done out of fear or overprotection for what may happen, or because others living or attending the same environment need more supports 
than those that are put in place. And so those are put in place for everyone. Um, so then we start getting into potential rights restrictions when we uh, over support people because of the needs of someone else in that environment. So, um, you know, one thing to remember is, well, you know, no one can guarantee total safety in any environment. And that goes for all of us. We do expect that reasonable precautions are taken uh, to keep people safe. Indicator B, um, the second indicator in safe environments, is about the physical environment and does it promote people's health, safety, and independence. So while there's only one probe that is highlighted here, um, a lot of the other ones here are really, you know, pretty basic. And they, you know, almost read regulatory in a way. So as you can see, the first one talks about buildings and homes. Do they comply with all the fire and safety codes? And this is most often met through uh, fire marshal reviews, things like that. The second probe talks about, um, you know, compliance with applicable environmental codes. Um, and the examples given here are, are they free of lead paint, of radon, mercury, asbestos? So we just wanna make sure that any homes, offices, and other buildings um, are free of, of these things. So probe four is the probe that's, that's highlighted here. And this is really about ensuring that all modifications made um, or that need to be made um, are in place and will assist each person to be able to use their environments to the fullest. So this can include a lot of different things depending on the individual person. This could be things such as ramps, both inside and outside of the home, um, rails, um, handrails in the bathroom, handrails in a hallway, in a kitchen, uh, wherever they may be necessary for a person, especially if they're at um, increased risk for falls. It, it also includes things like lowered closet rods so I can access, um, you know, get my own clothes and I don't have to wait for someone else to get them for me. Um, widened doorways, access to the home and building, vehicle modifications. We, we can't forget about modifying vehicles so that people can um, get around their community as they want. And also the use of technology. So there's a lot of technology that's starting, much more and more technology that's starting to be used in the area of safety for people. So this could include strobe lights, um, bed shakers um, used in an emergency to help wake people up, med alert devices. Um, it could also be things like lowered peepholes or video doorbells so that people can see who's at their door. Again, we talked about vehicle modifications, um, and we, we want to make sure that we remember, again, both um, modifications inside the home and outside the home, within the vehicles, and then in the buildings that people frequent, so offices and day programs and um, workplaces. Now, we need to remember some people may not need any modifications, but for those that have higher mobility support needs or have hearing or vision impairments, modifications are often necessary and should be put in place as needed for each individual person. Indicator C talks about having individualized emergency plans. So there are five uh, probes in this area. And there are two specifically that are highlighted. Now, probe two, we just talked about in the last indicator. We talked about, or the last um, indicator, we talked about alarms and visual signals and other modifications um, being put in place for people as needed. In indicator C, the first probe, is about emergency plans and uh, do they address missing persons, fire, and severe weather. Now, most organizations um, have, but all organizations should have appropriate protocols in place that outline what to do in a fire, 
in case of missing persons and severe weather. Now again, severe weather is going to mean a number of different things depending on where you live. While there should be organization-wide protocol, there should also be protocols specific to program locations and homes. So the residential home, um, a person's apartment, a day program, and then as needed for each individual person. For example, with fires, uh, there should be an overarching plan for each location, but then also something that outlines what type of supports each, each person needs. So it may sound simple, we're gonna put into place a, a, an evacuation plan for, for each person. You may think, well, the plan should be just everybody needs to get out of the house, but there's going to be a difference in the type of support to each person needs, especially when a person uses a wheelchair, um, they're slower moving, um, they have a visual impairment or a hearing impairment. It could depend on the layout of the house and where a person's bedroom is, where the um, exit points are of any uh, building. And there's also a difference in the type of supports that people may need during the day compared to overnight. During the day, I can easily leave my house if I would hear something or smell something. But at night, I may be a little harder to wake up because I sleep very soundly and I maybe don't wake up as quickly to an alarm or somebody yelling that there's a fire. Or if I use a wheelchair, I may need help to get into my wheelchair. And so when you think about the time that that may take, um, it adds a whole nother level of safety supports that need to be put in place. So there are so many things that need to be thought about for each individual person, especially as there are more and more support needs with that person. But also don't forget, needs during the day may be very different for each person than needs during the time when they're sleeping. It's also beneficial to outline important information for each person if an emergency would occur. And what I mean by that is, does a person say have a specific personal item that they would have a hard time leaving behind or that would comfort them and should be brought with them if there is a need to relocate? So if there is a, um, if you're in a place where there's tornadoes or you know of a hur an impending hurricane, is there somebody that you support that is very attached to say a, a, a picture or a, photo album or a um, uh, can't sleep without their sleep machine or have a, you know, a preferred um, stuffed animal, if you will, some people do, um, that would be hard for them to leave without and really would not make them feel very safe if they didn't have with them. So we really want to make sure that um, in, we're looking at each person individually and if there's any specific item that would just help them to stay calm in an emergency. We also want to think about things um, like civil disturbance, um, which is also known, um, sometimes known as active shooter. So we want to see is there an organizational plan in place um, that talks about civil disturbance and what steps would need to be taken um, should something like that um, unfortunately occur. And um, actually the Department of Homeland Security has some good resources um, when it comes to civil disturbance and, and active shooter uh, planning. For missing persons, you will also wanna think about the use of silver alerts or amber alerts if you work with children. So if you work with children, uh, what's the process to, um, to, to uh, put into place an amber alert? And if you're supporting um, seniors or people with disabilities, um, what's the process in your state or your county or your town um, to put a silver alert into place? So those are things that as you're developing um, emergency plans, uh, you will wanna to think about. So missing plans, you know, uh, it's a really a good idea, missing persons plans. Um, to include the use of those uh, different types of alerts that are available. Probe 4 is about data, 
and looking at data from safety drills to assess the effectiveness of those drills and plans um, to ensure that follow-up has been implemented. Now with this probe, there should be a system, a way that each organization is monitoring and reviewing that emergency drills are being done. So not only to ensure that they're being done to the frequency necessary, um, which many states, if not all states, um, and, and within other countries, you know, really have a regulation around. But we also want to make sure that um, evacuation timeframes are meeting those requirements, if there are any. And if there's any problems or concerns, that those are being monitored. A good thing here is to also monitor um, that all people are engaging in evacuation drills to the level that they need. Sometimes um, things that I notice on um, accreditations is that when a drill is held, a person may be absent. So what I will do is start to look for trends to see, is this person always absent? So while drills may be occurring um, at, at a good frequency, if there's a person that's always gone during those drills, they're not getting the same level of support in case there were an emergency. So that's another thing that um, you know, should, be, should be monitored is that um, if people are gone during those drills, are we doing makeup drills? Are we sitting down and reviewing with them the process um, if there, that emergency uh, were to occur? That all being said, we want to make sure that people aren't being over drilled um, because what can happen when people are, are, are drilled or put through drills so much is that they become desensitized to alarms or to the process itself and they don't start taking it seriously. So we want to make sure too that drills aren't occurring so much that people just start tuning them out because they're so used to them occurring and they just think, well, it's just a drill. So we want to be really careful of that. It, we want to make sure that there's a, the right balance for each person when it comes um, to uh, practicing any kind of emergency drill. So typically data is looked at or organizations may have a system where the drill is done and then the, um, if the drill is done on paper, it then goes to another level, the manager, supervisor, or a safety person, and they take a look at them. And then perhaps the safety committee reviews um, all the drills or looks at them um, for any concerns um, or issues uh, that may be, uh, may be occurring. So it depends again on the size of the organization um, and what system uh, works best for you. If there's an electronic health record system where um, drill information is put into, these drills may automatically go to several levels um, of review. So it just depends on within the organization, um, you know, what is set up, but there needs to be a system for review and not just the drill is done and we stick the piece of paper into a binder in the home. The last indicator in, in factor six is indicator D, which talks about routine inspections and ensuring that environments are sanitary and hazard free. In this indicator, there's five, uh, five probes. Um, as you can see, there are two specifically that I highlighted. So, factor uh, probe two talks about um, organizations having a system for completing internal inspections or reviews. So what this really is asking is, within the organization, is there an internal way that you are completing environmental inspections? Do you have a checklist, a form, something that you use internally on an ongoing basis um, to really inspect the environment to make sure everything is where it needs to be. We don't just want to wait for licensure or the fire marshal or the city or whomever else it may be. Um, each organization should have um, a system or a way um, with a frequency of monthly or quarterly, whatever works best, to uh, really review each location and look for very specific things. 
And this could just be to make sure there are no safety hazards, that um, things are working properly, that say furnace filters um, or other types of filters are being changed at the frequency they need to be. Um, it, it just depends. Sometimes it may be maintenance staff that do this. Other times it may be a QI department or it may be a, a, a manager of a, of a group home that does this. But no matter the type of service, there should be a way that we're inspecting just to ensure that people's environments are safe and there are no safety hazards. So we wanna make sure too um, that there's a system in place for how this gets done, who does them, what happens to the documentation, who reviews it, and then how does the necessary follow-up get completed? So sometimes what happens is we see a system where um, people will go out and they do these inspections, but what happens is they note, um, they note follow-up that needs to be done, but then that's where it ends. And I can tell from my own experience that this used to happen a lot. Um, you really have to have a strong system in place to ensure that when, um, when we're identifying follow-up that needs to be done, that there's a system to ensure that, that, that follow-up gets to who needs to do it, and then that gets taken care of. Okay, we wanna make sure that that loop is closed. In probe three, um, this is about um, the system. Is there a system to report when there are environmental concerns? So again, this kind of you know, relates back to probe two. This could be that something it's broken, it's leaking. Um, who gets contacted? Does everyone know this process? And when I say everyone, I mean staff, I mean people receiving services, I mean families. Do people understand who they need to go to to report that something is broken or something needs to be fixed. How long does it take to get a response? Okay, so we want to make sure that um, the system, um, it's timely as it talks about in probe four. So are those concerns, are those hazards being corrected in a timely manner? Okay. And then how do we know that it's actually been taken care of? Okay. Remember, you know, with environmental hazards, we're looking at both the interior and the exterior of buildings and homes. And this isn't just group homes if we operate group homes. It's um, any day program locations, any, any other type of work locations that we operate. It's um, office buildings. If we operate office buildings, um, we want to make sure we're looking at, um, looking at all environments. We wanna make sure there are no trip hazards, say leading up to the front door. You know, what are the safety precautions in winter climates? Um, are wooden handrails smooth and not going to cut someone's hand open if they use it? So it, is it, has it been sanded down? Is it smoother? Are there um, uh, chunks of wood coming up so that there, there's a potential to get blisters if you would run your hand across there or use it because you need assistance um, with your mobility. Is there proper lighting on the exterior of the home that's going to help people feel safe at night? Because um, from you know the many visits that I've done to a lot of different homes, um, it's really tough, and it really even makes me feel nervous um, when I get to homes and there's there's no lighting on the outside of the home, or it's very hard to see where you're going um, or walking up to the home. So making sure that there are lights, um, motion sensored lights are all, always nice so that they just automatically come on as people come up to the front. So those are the four indicators in the area of safety. Um, with safe environments, a lot of them seem really, really basic, um, but we really want to dive into each, each probe um, and we want to really look at for each individual person what we have in place. So again, um, you know, we can't protect from all potential safety issues, but we must put reasonable, reasonable precautions in place. So here are some resources. Um, now these are all uh, links to websites and this um, slide deck will be sent uh, to everyone. So you will have 
um, access to these when uh, you receive the slide deck in a, in a week or so. Um, but just a little bit about some of the resources up in the first section. Um, the, the first link is to, um, an educational booklet on how to respond to an active shooter. It's actually a pretty good booklet. Um, and again, it's through the Department of Homeland Security. Um, it's one that I've used and I've shared with some people before. The second one is a PDF, and, and I have to warn everyone, it is quite large. It's 468 pages, so it takes some time to download. But it's a training guide for safety at home, work, and in public. And it's actually written for youth, but it's really beneficial to anyone. Um, I went through it again, um, and there's a lot of really good modules in there. What I do want to remind people about this one, though, um, is in one of the modules, um, the, that module is on safety and sexuality. And there are some um, very, um, some graphic visual aids um, in that section. So it may be something that if you wanna take a look at it, download it, take a look through it, um, you can use the different modules as each one of them focuses on different things. Um, but it really is a pretty good, um, a, a pretty good PDF um, of uh, safety training. The third um, area, um, the third website is um, actually an article from the ACLU on promoting safety for people. And then the last link is another article from the ACLU on helping community organizations be prepared for emergencies. So some good reading there that could also lead to, um, have some different links to some other things that may be very beneficial. And of course, we have our quality and practice guides on the CQL website, uh, one on safety and one on understanding risk. So now that we've looked at factor six, the indicators and the probes that make up this factor, um, let's talk a little bit about validation and decision making. So um, each probe, so each one of those individual probes is validated as present or not present based on evidence presented and discovered during a review. Okay. So each of the indicators, there were four in factor six and there are 46 total, we validate them at the system and practice level. And we're really looking for prevalence um, when it comes to practices. It isn't based, um, it isn't gonna be marked as yes or present based on a given number of probes, um, we're really looking at prevalence within the practice. Um, during an accreditation, when an indicator is found to be not present in either system or practice or both, then we will require an action plan. And when an action plan is required, the organization is given 30 days to develop the plan for how they're going to bring that indicator into alignment. In other words, what are the steps that the organization is going to put into place to have this indicator be considered present? And remember, the title of the indicator is not always a complete description of all the elements within that indicator. Um, as you can see, the probes talk about a number of different things, and so don't just get hung up on the title of the indicator. There are a lot of different pieces within each one of those. So with validation and decision making, I wanted to take a specific look at, look at one indicator. And so with indicator 6C, this talks about individualized emergency plans. Okay. So there are several probes that address individualized supports. As you can see here, probe two and probe three. But of key significance, probe one really addresses needed supports in the area. It speaks to really to individualize supports, and this one would be considered fundamental and could have an outsized impact when we're looking at that area. So probe one is about those emergency plans addressing missing persons, fire, and severe weather. Even if the other probes in this indicator are present, if this one is not, um, most likely it's going to have an outsized impact onto whether that system or practice is in place for this indicator. 
some things to think about too with this. Uh, you know, we talked about civil disturbance, but also things to think about are cybersecurity. Um, this is really important as more organizations are moving to electronic health records and documentation systems. And then um, internet safety um, as for those people um, that are wanting to use the internet, wanting to do things on the internet, are we providing supports to help them learn um, how to be safe online? Um, and in the, the one resource that we looked at in one of the, in the previous slide, that does have a module that, that talks about that. There's some red flags in the area of safe environments. So um, there are certain things that will be reviewed as part of factor six. Um, actually, yeah. Um, so the red flags are um, things like the physical environment is unsafe or it's extremely unsanitary. People are not being provided with the safety supports that they need. Um, if there are safety concerns from staff, family, or people supported that are not being addressed, that is a red flag. And if people or staff have had no training in how to handle emergency situations. So if there's no training or education around um, what to do in a fire, or what to do in other um, emergencies, th this could be a red flag as well. Some things that we are measuring in factor six, um, we'll, we'll always look at things like safety committee minutes um, or incident review or risk management committee, whatever your, your committees defined, whoever is looking at um, safety uh, within the organization. We also look at policies and procedures on disaster preparedness. And then of course, um, internal inspections. What is the system? For that and we always like to see um, what are you using to complete your internal inspection. We're looking at training for staff and people supported in the area of safety. We'll also look at data on emergency drills and those external and internal inspections. So we'll look at the most recent um, licensure reviews. We'll look at the most recent um, you know, uh, reviews from OSHA, if you had one, or the fire marshal, or whomever it may be, um, we're going to want to see um, those inspections. And then from POM interviews, um, from personal outcomes, um, the areas of people are safe and people use the environments really help to inform this basic assurances indicator or factor, um, factor six. So, some data around factor six and safe environments. This first slide um, talks about um, the number of systems and pra practices that are typically present within an organization. Now, all this data I'm gonna show you um, is data from 177 organizations um, that was completed um, from reviews completed between 2015 and 2017. This slide shows that on average, organizations had 7.6 of the eight possible indicators in factor six present. So the four indicators, system and practice in each, so of those eight areas, on average, agencies had 7.6 of all those areas met. This one shows that on average agencies had 3.8 out of the four possible factor six indicator practices in place, and then had an average of 3.7 of systems in place. So uh, about even for both system and practice being in place in each of the indicators. This figure shows what percentage of organizations had each indicator present during a CQL review. So as you can see, organizations were most likely to have the system in place for 6B, which is the physical environment promotes people's health, safety, and independence. Okay, that's where they were most likely to have it in place during a CQL review. And although still very high, the lowest measure was for the practice in indicator 6C, the organization has individualized emergency plans. 
So all of these are still very high numbers, um, but as you can see, 6B, the system, was most often found to be in place uh, by CQL. This figure shows the differences in organization self-assessment and CQL reviewers' assessment for factor six. The numbers show that the organization overestimated the presence of almost every indicator. But organizations were most likely to overestimate systems and practices in place for 6C. So what that means is the organization was more likely to say this was in place than CQL was in that particular area. Okay? The, those top lines should actually say 6C and not um, 6A. So this figure shows the impact having factor six, both systems and practices in place, can have on all of the basic assurances, so all 46 indicators. And according to our statistical analysis, the more factor six indicators an organization has present, the better they do on the total basic assurances. So for an example, an organization that has none of these indicators present, so no systems, no practices, is only expected to have 39% of all indicators in place. Whereas an organization that has all of these systems and practices in place for factor six is expected to have 89% of the total basic assurances present. So essentially when organizations that tend to safe environments in both systems and practices, they're not only significantly more likely to have all other factors present, but they're also more likely to have enhanced quality services. So our last data slide here is about the most impactful probes. So these are just like outcome correlations that we do for the personal outcome measures. The numbers indicate the relationship between the, the specific probe listed and the total of the factor six score. So the important thing really is that it lists them in order of importance. In other words, by having each of these present, the organization is most likely to have more present in factor six. Now it doesn't mean the other probes aren't important, it's just that these specific probes are the ones that have the greatest relationship of having all of factor six present. So if these are in place, these are the top five ones that are more likely than to show that other probes are in place in factor six. So it looks like we have a few minutes left. Um, Jen, do we have any questions? Just a few. Okay. We have um, someone wondering, is there a rough guideline for frequency of drills to avoid over drilling? I don't think there's a rough guideline because it depends so much on um, regulations that um, you have to follow based on where you provide services um, and each individual person. So each state or even county or, um, you know, wherever you live um, may have specific guidelines on the minimum requirements, but there's some people that may need more. There's some people that may need only um, that amount. And then even within the same states or, or provinces or areas, depending on the type of service that may be different. So if you provide 24 hour group home setting, there may be different requirements than for someone that's um, receiving only intermittent services um, in their own place or um, work, you know, uh, receive shared living services or, or host home, has a host home provider. So you really need to gauge that on an individual level to ensure that um, people aren't being over drilled. Sometimes you'll notice that people are overdrilled when they just start refusing to participate in them or they say are sleeping through them or refuse to move um, when, um, when they are being ran. So that's something to, something to take a look at for each person. Any more? Um, I have someone asking, should the agency's office buildings be completing drills with office staff? I always say absolutely, um, because uh, safe environments is not just about people receiving services, um, but our employees as well. 
um, it, it's not going to be done at the frequencies, say, of, um, you know, doing a drill in a group home or a day program. Um, but it is important that, you know, maybe once or even twice a year um, that you're doing some sort of a fire evacuation drill. Um, you're at least talking about what to do in a tornado or, or a thunderstorm, not a thunderstorm, um, earthquake, what, whatever it may be um, in, your, in your area. Um, but absolutely, I, it's best practice. Um, and this would also include um, the civil disturbance or active shooter drills. Um, it's oftentimes a main office um, that you really should start at with these type of drills. Um, because unfortunately, you never know when you may have a disgruntled staff. Um, you may have a disgruntled uh, family member of a staff person. Um, so those are things to always think about and, and to have a plan in place and, and to practice. But again, it's not going to be at the frequency as you would um, at, say, a day program or, um, you know, a residential location. We have another one asking about a day site. They have approximately 120 individuals and they have a site specific, but wondering still how to make it more individualized for those individuals. You know, and each person in, in a place where you have 100 people, um, a, a day program, uh, you, you know, for each person you may just want to assess, are there any additional level of support needs that this person has? Um, if it is assessed and indicated that there are no additional support level needs, they evacuate when necessary, um, there have never been any issues, then that's what you know. But if you have someone that requires more support that uses a wheelchair, it is a little more slow moving, you may just want to make sure that there's something written that indicates the, the exact supports that that person is going to need to evacuate safely. It doesn't have to be a large complex plan. It could just be something very simple um, as you know, one staff is going to ensure um, that this person um, is safe and one person will be assigned to, to them to assist them in, in getting out of the, you know, the, uh, the building. Um, so that really is gonna come down to each person. You may only have you know, four or five people out of 100 that need an additional level of, of supports. Um, but for anybody else, you would just note that they, they don't need any other level because they follow, you know, all requirements when a drill is ran. That is it for questions. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Jen. And thanks, everyone, for the great questions. Um, any other questions or, um, you know, just in what we talked about or questions about resources, uh, my contact information is listed on the screen. Feel free to uh, email me if you have any questions or are looking for additional resources, as well as don't forget our e-community um, on Facebook. Um, lots of organizations that we partner with have some great resources um, in the area of, of safety that um, they are always willing to share. So, Megan, um, would you like to finish this off with any uh, additional information? I just had a thought I wanted to share with everyone. Um, this week is actually National Fire Prevention Week. Um, when Liz and I planned this webinar, we, we didn't realize how relevant we would be, but um, it, so uh, I just wanted to share that with everyone. Um, Liz, we'll have to uh, plan that one for next time. <laughs> Thank you, Megan. <laughs> Thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, today's webinar has been recorded and we'll be sending that out in a week or so. Um, if you have any questions, please let us know. If you are a certified interviewer or trainer, your attendance today has been recorded in our database to meet your continuing education requirements. And hopefully we'll see some of you at our conference in a few weeks.